Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I want to thank Prosecutor Staff and Koch uh, for hosting tonight's event. Uh, Prosecutor Koch for that uh, incredibly kind introduction. Uh, he indicated that I'll be going to all of these, or at least one of these events in each of these counties. Uh, I hope this counts for Sussex and Morris. I've been to Sussex, but not for one of these events. Um, it really is a privilege to be with you this evening. Uh, as Prosecutor Koch alluded to, uh, improving police community relations is one of my top priorities as Attorney General. And the 2121 project was one of our first initiatives. And that's the 21 county, 21st century policing project. And the goal there was to ask each of our county prosecutors to go into their communities, to go to churches like this one, to talk about issues of mutual concern between law enforcement and community. And the hope was that if we required our prosecutors to have one of these meetings each quarter, that would be 84 community meetings across the state. But, but the hope was that it wouldn't end with those 84 meetings, that those 84 meetings would seed relationships and future conversations. Because it was important for me to develop relationships of trust in a comfortable setting like this one, because it's much easier to have a conversation here than near a yellow police team in the wake of a crisis. And we chose our topics very carefully during our first year. During 2018, the first quarter, we talked about officer-involved shootings, one of the, the most sensitive topics we deal with, one of the most important investigations we conduct, and, and probably one of the biggest flashpoints if we don't get it right. And so all 21 of our county prosecutors went into their communities and had discussions about our protocols for investigating these types of cases. And then we moved on to the opioid crisis, which is ravaging the state, to talk about how we're getting away from a law enforcement approach to a public health approach to this crisis to, to help break that cycle of overdose arrest and to prevent the next fatal overdose. And then we moved on to talk about bias crimes. And then we're moving on to the immigration directive now. But the hope is that you know, these just see these conversations and that the conversations carry on uh, long after the four quarterly meetings are done. And, and there's, no, there's no sort of magic uh, here. It's the fact that law enforcement works better when the community trusts us to report crime, when they trust us to, to interact with us on the street, and, and we better understand community concerns when we have these types of relationships. The Immigrant Trust Directive, the, the topic of conversation tonight, and bias crimes, which will also be discussed this evening, I, I think I want to talk about more the origins of that directive and the reasoning behind it and how it came to be, because you'll hear from Joe Walsh from our office who will walk you through what that directive is and what it isn't. About the origins, as a county prosecutor in Bergen, uh, I saw that changes in immigration priorities at the federal level were having a chilling effect on my ability as a county prosecutor to investigate and prosecute crimes. They were having a chilling effect on, on witnesses coming forward and testifying to uh, the fact that they had been victims of crimes. Uh, it was my experience as a county prosecutor and, and as an attorney general early on uh, that there was a culture of fear that had been cultivated. A uh, fear that uh, drove our most vulnerable residents further into the shadows. There were residents who feared going to the grocery store, for example, because they feared that a, a traffic stop would land them in deportation proceedings. They feared reporting uh, the fact that they had been the victims of fraud because they thought they would end up in a deportation center. They feared going to court to testify against their abuser because they feared that they would be swept up by ICE while they were there. And so it was important for me to draw a clear, bright line between what we do as state law enforcement officers and what we don't do. That our priorities are and have always been to ensure public safety and to enforce the state's criminal laws and to cooperate with our federal law enforcement partners on criminal matters that we do not enforce civil immigration deportation orders, that we don't go out on civil immigration enforcement rates. And, and this is nothing new. 
And so when I hear a lot of sort of controversy and backlash between what we did and, and, and folks criticizing it, we just clearly defined what we did in 2007 when our original directive was in place, and we clearly defined the realities of today. And we made clear that in the wake of recent court decisions, when it comes to our county jails and, and, and uh, detainer requests, that we will not honor detainers beyond the date of release, except in the most serious of cases. And then Joe will walk you through those exceptions, because it's important for us to, to be clear about what we are doing and what we're not doing. And it's our hope, with these small steps, that we build trust and that folks feel comfortable interacting with law enforcement, that folks feel comfortable reporting crimes, that folks feel comfortable testifying at trial. But what I'm most proud of with this directive is that it's reflective of how we're operating at the Attorney General's office. We didn't sit in an ivory tower at the Hughes Justice Complex and just come up with this. This was a priority when we got in office. And the way we established and created this directive was by sitting down with stakeholders, by having partners from law enforcement, by sitting down with the state PBA, the FOP, by bringing in civil rights groups, by bringing in the Jail Wardens Association, by bringing all the people who are involved in the administration of justice in this state to the table, and spending eight months of back and forth to hash out the contours of this directive. And the reason I know it's a good directive is because no one was 100% happy with it. <laughs> That's true. I mean, it is very difficult to please everybody, and if you're pleasing everybody, you're not doing your job. But we had tough conversations, and we came up with clear guidelines to draw that distinction between what we do and what the federal authorities do and what we don't do. And that was important to me. Again, we called it the Immigrant Trust Directive to build trust so we could do our jobs in protecting public safety. And let me also be clear about what this directive is not. You know, I, I, I always get this question, well, aren't you giving sanctuary to people who will commit crimes? Absolutely not. Let me be clear about this. If you commit a crime in this state, you're going to jail regardless of your immigration status. There's no free pass to commit crime as a result of this directive. So I, I hope you will listen to uh, Joe Walsh from our office as he walks through what this directive is about, because I think it'll just make plain that these are common sense rules reaffirming what we do and have been doing, and making clear based on recent case law what we can't do when it comes to our county jails. With respect to bias crimes, I think it's fitting that we're having this discussion in tandem when it comes to the Immigrant Trust Directive and about our view on bias offenses in the state. We have zero tolerance for bias incidents or bias crimes. And we have with us Rachel Abner, who's our director of our Division on Civil Rights, and we have folks from our Division of Criminal Justice here, because we want to make plain that we have zero tolerance with respect to bias incidents that constitute violations of civil rights, and we have zero tolerance for those incidents that constitute crimes. And we want everyone in the room to understand the difference. And we want everyone in the room to understand that we are fully committed at the Attorney General's office to working with our 21 county prosecutors, to working with the agencies within the Attorney General's office, the Division on Civil Rights, the Division of Criminal Justice, to making sure that we root out this type of conduct in this state. And this trust directive is meant to make people who are the most vulnerable here in some cases feel comfortable reporting that conduct. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joe uh, in a moment, or Rachel's going first. But let me, uh, let me do this. I, I have to uh, leave a little bit early. I have sick children at home and a sick wife. Uh, but I want to answer any questions you have before I leave. Uh, and it just takes some moments uh, so we have the benefit of the discussion if you have anything. Uh, that you want to ask of me directly about what we're doing with respect to this initiative or with respect to any of our other initiatives. Yes, ma'am. Is there an educational program going out to the immigrants so that they know everything that you're saying here? Is there a way of making sure they're informed? That, that's an incredible question. Uh, when we put this uh, trust directive together, we announced it at, at the Statue of Liberty, at Ellis Island, at the train station where millions of people began their journeys to become citizens and to become 
part of the parcel of the fabric of this country, and we did it with law enforcement standing there, with stakeholders standing there, but the law enforcement that was standing there were individuals who grew up speaking a different language at home. And so we had uh, members of the state police who spoke Creole at home. We had members of the state police who spoke Spanish at home or Arabic, and we had a chief of police who spoke Arabic. And we recorded videos explaining what the trust directive are in something like, what is it, Joe, 12 or 13 or 14 languages? Uh, with accompanying material that are available on our website. I think it's just njoag.gov forward slash trust or immigrant trust, but Joe will give you that uh, website. Uh, and that's available. Uh, we have Spanish language materials, foreign language handouts about what has changed and what has not changed with, with this directive. Uh, and also some rights organizations have uh, produced their own explanation of what the directive is and we could get that information uh, and make that more publicly available. Uh, all, all law enforcement in the state by March 15th uh, will be trained on it and that's when the directive takes full effect in, in the state of New Jersey. Thank you for that question. Yes, sir. Did you define um, a bias crime? So, so there is no specific crime called a bias crime in the state of New Jersey, and I think our, our, our Bias Crimes Officers Association will give you the listing of the crimes. There's seven or eight uh, specific offenses under 2C, our criminal code. If your motivation to commit that crime is because of bias of a protected group, and they'll explain that during their presentation, then that would constitute a, a bias-related uh, crime. Uh, and there are enhanced sentencing penalties and so on and so forth. Uh, for those uh, types of crimes. Uh, and then a bias incident would be something that's motivated by bias that doesn't rise to the level of a crime. But uh, Rachel Adler, our director of the Division on Civil Rights, will speak to you about the law against discrimination uh, and about how we're trying to build out. Uh, one of the things that's important to me is data and, and information collecting. Uh, and as we try to get better at what we're doing across the Department of Law and Public Safety, we want to be able to receive complaints more efficiently and follow up on them more efficiently. Uh, we're trying to build out systems, and, and that's something that Rachel is working on in conjunction with the, the Division on Civil Rights, because if it doesn't constitute a, a violation of the law against discrimination as discrimination in public accommodations, or is it more serious, then we want to get it to the right people uh, so we can root out this type of conduct. Yes, sir. Um, I know that since criminal justice reform and uh, the elimination of bail that we've had uh, a lot of vacancy in our county jails, which is probably a good thing. But uh, do I understand that our policy is not to uh, hold uh, immigration detainers uh, in the county jail still beyond, like what you said, the uh, release date for the Okay. Yeah, so, so let me uh, just unpack that for everyone's benefit. Uh, in, in 2017, we started the journey for under criminal justice reform where we moved from a, a cash-based system of bail where there was bails assigned to every type of crime to a risk-based system. And that was motivated by the fact that we have a lot of folks in our county jails uh, pre-trial being held on low bails and were low risk. And so they would sometimes stay beyond their whatever sentence they would get and end up pleading out. And that was not an outcome that the Chief Justice uh, favored or anyone else in law enforcement favored, and we had a constitutional amendment. And we, and we moved forward to this risk-based system. Now when somebody's arrested in one of the departments here, uh, they're fingerprinted, which is called live scanning, and an algorithm kicks in, and a risk assessment is done. So from 2017 to 20. Uh, 19 to present, our pretrial jail population has gone down from over 8,000 to under 4,000. Uh, and here's the other thing, crime has not gone up in the, in the, during the same period because there was some chicken little stuff going on that the sky was going to fall, crime was going to go up. Crime is still continuing to go down at the same pace as it has always been going down. The folks who are not being held pretrial are given conditions based on their risk. So that has freed up jail capacity. Detainers. Detainers, after someone is sentenced uh, or served their time in county jail or is otherwise able to be released, maybe on the, based on the risk assessment that the judge has done, that there's no basis to hold them pretrial. Uh, and if, a, if there's a detainer lodged and, and Joe will go through the circumstances, that detainer is a, a request. It's not a judicial warrant. Uh, we honor judicial warrants. 
Uh, we honor uh, warrants issued by judges to hold somebody or to turn them over. But a detainer is just an administrative warrant signed off by an officer saying, hold this person for me. The problem was it was being used in a way to hold people for 48 hours or 72 hours or for extended periods of time in violation of their Fourth Amendment rights after someone else said you could leave. Uh, and, and courts have consistently found that to be unconstitutional. So we have set forward a policy that we will hold certain categories of folks till 11.59 that night to give uh, people time to come in to pick up this person uh, in a limited amount of circumstances. Now that excess capacity, uh, you know, some jails, and, and, and this is a county decision which I can't uh, weigh in on, are, are releasing the excess capacity to hold uh, pre-trial immigration detainees. Uh, my home county, Bergen, does it. Uh, that's what's called an intergovernmental services agreement, and I don't have jurisdiction over that, and that's a, a county freeholder and a county government decision on how to best use their resources. So I think that's what we were talking about, about immigration detainees. That's wholly separate from the criminal system we're talking about now. Hopefully that answers yes. your concerns. Yes, sir. What do we do about elected officials who attend rallies that are protesting this directive and publicly make a joint statement giving immigration facts from FAIR, which I'm sure you're yep. aware of? Um, yep. How do we hold them to a higher standard? It's, you know, you talked about you want to have good relations with all of our people in our community. Yep. When you have your very public elected officials attending a rap and giving stretched facts or statistics, what does that do then to our immigrant community? How, what is, how it erodes the trust that you're trying to put back? Yeah, I, I mean, listen, I, it's the beauty of our political system. The way you hold that in check is at the ballot box, I suppose, the best way. Um, but I would just say that whatever they're saying, they don't have the authority to regulate the administration of criminal justice in this state. The Attorney General's office has that, uh, and I'm vested with a lot of responsibility and a lot of authority by the Criminal Justice Act of 1970, so I could set policy that applies to the 21 county prosecutors, to law enforcement operations in the state. Uh, and it's incumbent on me to, to, when I hear that, to clear up these types of misconceptions, and believe me, we do. And that's why, you know, when people are talking about crime going up and, 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 and you know, all the, the sky is falling after this and you're going to give pass, passes to people to commit crimes, it's hogwash. It's nonsense. No one is giving anyone a free pass to commit crime. That, that, that's the opposite of what we're trying to do here. That's the opposite of what we do on a daily basis. We want to improve public safety. We want people to feel comfortable reporting crimes, we want to have folks testify in a domestic violence case. Uh, and uh, I have done more cases than probably any other, other attorney general in their work as a, a federal prosecutor with ICE, and we have no problem working with ICE Homeland Security Investigations. We will work with them on task forces, but that's to enforce our criminal laws. That's to take drug dealers off the street. That's to take gang members off the street. All that work is going on and is allowed for by us. ICE uh, removal operations, that's their other side of the house. That's the side of the house we're saying, if this is your priority, that's your priority, but you're not going to use our resources to forward that immigration priority because we have limited resources and we're going to commit our resources to fighting crime in this state, and that's what we're concerned about. Another myth that's often thrown out there is that uh, the Attorney General's directive is now going to make it such that if an ICE officer is in distress, in, in, in this town, you're going to just let them suffer and, and, and be in, in harm's way. No. Law enforcement will support anybody who's in harm's way, including the nice officer if he's doing a civil enforcement operation and, and there's some danger to them or something, some tragedy befalls them, of course we're going to help. To suggest the opposite would be just nonsense. And I think it's incumbent on me to just sort of, you know, do that. And it's incumbent on our 21 county prosecutors to help stay on message as to what we're doing and what we're not doing and what's changed and what's not changed. Yes, sir. Hi, yeah. I'm Montel Rado from the Red Bear newspaper uh, of North County. I have a question. Is there any law enforcement agency that is not on board with this in New Jersey that might be in an area where they kind of agree with the step of enforcement by the federal government in this situation? And have you been 
dealing with that at all. Uh, it has not come to our attention, and if that were the case, uh, unfortunately, they wouldn't have a choice. They have to abide by the Attorney General's directives. Uh, and, you know, we have supervisory authority over them to ensure that they comply with these directives, and, and I would hope the case would not be that we'd have to, have to exercise that uh, supervisory authority, but if need be, you know, we'll hold folks accountable if they don't abide by this first March 15th. Yes, sir. How, in what manner, the, uh, is law enforcement going to be trained? And if, um, say, that uh, from uh, somebody from the community makes a report that you know uh, a law enforcement official did something that was outside of this directive, how could we go about it? Sure, great question. Can everybody hear the questions for the most part? It's how how is law enforcement going to be trained? Uh, we have a we have a mechanism in place, uh, a statewide teaching mechanism, which Joe can talk about in his his uh, presentation, but they all have to go online, go through that portal, do this training by March 15th uh, of this year, be trained up on it. Uh, there are certain mechanisms built into the directive of reporting up to the county prosecutors and then to us at the end of the year about where you have complied or where you might have been asked to comply in, in, in uh, operations and where you said no or, uh, you know, th things of that nature, but if, if there's indication that folks are not abiding by the directive, uh, then I, you would report that any way in the normal course. You could report it to the county prosecutor's office. They have an internal affairs function, which they have supervisory authority in their counties over law enforcement, or you could report it to the attorney general's office. We have uh, hotlines and intake, and we have general supervisory authority over state law enforcement, uh, and, and we'll be looking closely at uh, as what's going on. Here's the other thing. I mean, let me also be plain about this. Uh, I, I spoke to multiple chiefs associations, and, and I would ask them, raise your hand if you're out there participating in civil immigration enforcement operations. No one raises their hands. So th this, this is more to clarify what we haven't been doing to make sure uh, that we don't start doing this type of work, and to let those vulnerable communities and citizens know and residents know that this is the line, and, and, and sometimes they don't know the difference between a municipal officer and an ICE officer, and that's what we're trying to clarify. Uh, there are some other nuances, and, and I don't want to take Joe's presentation away from him, uh, on 287G officers, where sometimes uh, some of our municipalities will enter into agreements to enforce federal civil immigration laws. There are four such agreements in place in the state, as of now, and, and the renewal of those agreements, uh, if they choose to renew it, is subject to my approval. I will look very carefully at the reasons for the request for such agreements and such authority uh, and, and you know, approve or disapprove them accordingly. Uh, Kevin Coughlin, Morristown Green. Can you just uh, elaborate on what might make you uh, approve a 287G uh, request or disapprove? I, I haven't heard of an argument to date that would make me approve a 287G renewal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right there and then there, and then I'll just call it a night because I don't want to take away from Rachel and everyone else. These are federal observations, but I did go online and, and, and uh, view the video, and I'm just a member of the community tonight um, representing myself and uh, my church home. So uh, I wanted to just suggest that trust, the, the message of trust to the immigrant population and those people who would be affected um, uh, positively by the, the new initiative is a very good idea. However, I think on the other side of that, we probably need more communication to the majority. The people that you're saying are objecting uh, to, because of misconceptions. So a communications effort, maybe public service announcement once sure. March 15th goes forward, would be probably beneficial to clear up some of this because your, 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 your um, points are very well taken. But we need to have that out Sure. I, I, I appreciate that, and, and we, we do have plans to do some of that. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we'll be holding similar meetings across the state uh, this quarter, and so hopefully that will help in that regard, but certainly we could do better in amplifying our message, and, and, and we'll get better at that. Yes, sir. Were any of the refugee children that were separated at the border brought up here? And if so, have we done anything to try to reunite them, or is that out of our hands? So, uh, I know our, 
our Division of Children and Families looked at that, I think there was a small number, but I don't know, and when I say small, I think less than 10 or during the period of family separation you're talking about. Uh, there's a very small number, in it, and I'd be speaking on bad information if I told you what, if I knew exactly what that number was right now, but uh, I also don't know where they stand in the process, but it, it wasn't the same numbers we were seeing in other states. <laughs> Research that so that if there's anything we can be doing to help the pressure, we can yeah, help remedy that. I, I don't think it's an issue at, at, at present, but we'll look into that. Uh, and we did look into it at the time that the policy was being enforced, and, and there wasn't uh, a, you know a large number of folks. And I think it's the Tel division of children and families was on top of it, uh, but we'll follow up on it to make sure that's the case. All right. Well, thank you so much, Erin, for a great presentation. I apologize. For that.